Hi, I'm Dr. Phil Ransombillo, Senior Pastor of the Standpoint Church. I want to thank you for joining in. Uh, before we proceed, I want you to subscribe to this YouTube channel and then follow us on all our social media platforms, I believe is going to be a blessing. So today I want to talk about what I've called your perspective of God, because I believe that your consciousness determines your reality. The picture of God you have affects to a very large extent what you get out of life and also how you receive from God. So it's important that we have the right perspective of who God is. And in the Bible, the scripture is clear that the perfect interpretation of who God is, is actually Christ, is actually Jesus. So Jesus is the full interpretation of who God is. And I will be sharing with you men who had uh, perspectives of God in ways that affected their experiences from the scripture. So firstly, let's see John chapter 1 and verse 18. The Amplified Version says something, says, No man has ever seen God at any time, the only unique son or the only begotten uh, son of God who is in the bosom, in the intimate presence of the Father, he has declared him, he has revealed him, now this is Jesus, that Jesus has revealed who God is and brought him out where he can be seen. So Jesus has revealed him, declared him, brought God out in a way that God can be perfectly seen. So it also goes on to say that he has interpreted him and he has made him known. So. Jesus has made God known. No man has seen God at any time. God is spirit. So the full expression of who God is, is in the person of Christ. If you really want to know who God is, you have to see Christ. You have to know who Jesus is, right? Another scripture says in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, who being in the brightness of his glory. It's talking about Jesus now, that he's in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person or the expression of his person. So it's important to know that Christ is the expression of who God is. Now the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 13, I'm using the NIV version, it says anyone who lives on milk, right, being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. And this is very critical because your mentality of God is as a result of the teachings that you hear. If you do not hear the right teaching, you cannot have the right picture of God. So Hebrews chapter five, verse 13 says that the one who is a baby is the one who is not acquainted with the teaching on righteousness. So what is the teaching on righteousness or what declares the teaching on righteousness? If you read Romans chapter one and verse 16, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, not to everyone who walks, but to everyone who believes, uh, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Then verse 17 says, for in it, that's in the gospel now, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So the gospel actually reveals the righteousness of God. And what is the gospel? The summary of what the gospel is basically is the grace of God, right? So that's what the gospel is. And it is talking about a good news that God has, through the work of Jesus Christ, expressed his great love towards mankind. So that's what the gospel is saying. And this gospel reveals the righteousness of God. It is these things that we hear that gives us uh, the right picture of who God is. And if you do not have this picture of God, your expectation uh, of life can be affected. Your perspective of who God is can be affected or tainted. So it's very important to know. Now, something happened in a place called Caesarea Philippi when uh, Jesus, one of the withdrawals that Jesus had, uh, he withdrew about four times. Decapolis was one of the places he withdrew to, uh, Syrophoenicia, uh, Bethsaida, and then he withdrew to a place called Caesarea Philippi. This was about a year before he was crucified. Now, when Jesus got there with his disciples, he asked the question, who do men say I am? And that is very critical because he wanted to know what the disciples thought about him. He also wanted to know what people thought about him, but more importantly, he wanted to know what the disciples thought about him. 
He wanted to see if what they thought about him was because of what other people thought about him. You know, so he said, who do you now say? He's now talking to Peter. Who do you now say I am? And Peter responds. Let me read it for you. Peter says in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16 to 17, he says, and Simon answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood had not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. So if you look at the scripture now, you will see that Peter actually had a revelation from God. It was legit. I mean, the way Jesus asked the question, he said, who do uh, men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So when G uh, Peter now responded and said, you are the Son of God, the Messiah, that had to be a revelation because he didn't say you are the son of man. He says you are the son of God. That was clearly a revelation from God. But there was something that happened. Peter had a legitimate revelation from God, but at the same time, he had a misconception of who God is. Are you still? So I want you to see this. In verse 20, you will see how Jesus now begins to talk to the disciples and he's telling them, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord. I mean, this was good intention, right? This shall not be unto thee. But he turned. Now Jesus turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that are of men. So you can see here now that Peter, this is just in one breath. Peter had a revelation from God. And then Jesus begins to talk about the interpretation of that revelation that he had by saying he's going to Jerusalem and he's going to die. So... When he said you are the Christ, the meaning of the word Christ is Messiah. If, if you look at that context, he's talking about his Messiahship. So Peter actually heard from God saying Jesus is the Messiah. But Peter's interpretation of Messiah was completely different from Jesus's interpretation of his Messiahship. Now, Peter's interpretation of Messiahship is that he's going to rise as uh, one of the generals to confront the Roman oppression that the Jews were having at the time or he's going to be a great warrior or he's going to raise an army because I mean anybody who can raise uh, the dead back to life and can feed 5,000 people you are a great general so Peter must have seen a general in Jesus who would confront the Roman oppression and give Israel her liberation at the time. So that was his idea of Messiah. But Jesus's idea of Messiah was not uh, sword and blood, but it was cross and blood. Jesus's idea of Messiah was that he would go to the cross and he would die. That is how he validates his messiahship. And it is in his dying that we have deliverance from sin because he's seen his father's kingdom. He's seen that people will come into relationship with God, but he would have to go through the cross. And anyone who puts faith in him is going to receive salvation. So now you can see that um, Jesus has a different understanding. This is a picture of the body of Christ today. How that people legitimately hear when God says to them, but their interpretation of that revelation is where the problem is. And many times, whether we like it or not, our interpretation of a revelation is a function of our mentality. And our mentality is a function of teaching, the kind of teaching that you hear. You know, sometimes people will say, God said, but your actions are contrary to what God has actually said because you do not have the right mentality. So that's what you see play out in the life of Peter here. So Peter did not have the right perspective. You could even see this play out even when Jesus was apprehended by some of the soldiers and Peter takes a sword and he's, he cuts off the ear of a man and Jesus takes the ear and puts it back and says, not so, this is not how I want to go about it. You know, so even towards the cross, 
Peter did, did not still get it. He didn't really get the point because it wasn't about sword, but it was about the cross. That was what messiahship was. So your perspective of God is very important and your consciousness determines your reality, like we said. If you see God as a loving father, you would experience the blessings and the benefits of your father. It will come to your experience because that's your picture of who God is. Your um, posture and your disposition towards life is also going to be affected because you see God correctly. But today, a lot of people think that God is judgmental, that God is manic, <laughs> that God is wicked, that a lot of people think God is like our earthly parents. A lot of people think God is like your, God is not your boyfriend, God is not your dad here on the earth, he's not your mom here on the earth. I mean, they can all be wonderful and lovely, but that's not who God is. God, the definition and the interpretation of God is how much he has loved you and the extent to which he went by sending Jesus to die for you. That's why the Bible says, herein is our love made perfect, okay? That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. For as he is, so are we. So you must know who you are. And the Bible says God has demonstrated this love in that while we yet sinners, Christ died for us. So it's important to understand. Another example, is a man called Job in the Bible. Uh, Job had a picture of God that was quite funny. I mean, he feared God, he revered God, uh, he, uh, he, he loved God, but Job had a funny interpretation of God that played out in his experiences. So if you hear when Job says, that which I fear has come upon me, those were his projections. You see, he was so afraid of God that he was even making sacrifices for his children just in case they had sinned against God because he didn't know what God would do to them. So all of these things eventually played out in Job's life. I know we all understand the narrative and we know how it went. You know, you may hear Job say, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. It wasn't, it wasn't God who took away. It was actually Satan that took it was actually Satan that killed. It wasn't God who killed. So Job did not read the book of Job to know that it was not God who did all of those things. God is a loving father. And I want to show you something that Job said. If you read Job chapter 42 verse 5, I'm reading the Amplified Version now. It says, I had heard of you. It's talking about God now. After Job had gone through the affliction, his friends had ridiculed him. Uh, they, some of them spoke wrongly about God and about him. Then he came to a conclusion. Uh, this is the end of Job. And Job now says in chapter 42, verse 5, I had heard of you only by the hearing of the ear. But now my spiritual eye sees you. So Job is saying that what I knew about you was hearsays. It was the hearing of the ear. But right now, my spiritual eye sees you. And that's where God wants you to come. God wants you to move from the place where your perspective of him is because of what people say about him. God wants you to know him in the person of Christ. He wants you to know him through the work of Christ. The extent to which he went when he sent Jesus to die for you. That's how God wants you to know him. He wants you to know him as a father who loves and he's crazy about loving you. Now see the message version of this Job uh, 42 verse 5 and 6. It says, I admit I once lived by rumors of you. So Job says, I lived by the rumors of you. I want you to mark the word lived. So Job was living on an impression of God. He lived by a rumor. So it's interesting how many times we live our lives but on an impression of who God is. And I want you to know that your picture of God is powerful to your life. If you see God wrongly, it affects your living. It affects how you live. So in, he now says, now I have it at first hand from my own eyes and ears. He says, I'm sorry, forgive me. I'll never do that again, I promise. I'll never again live on crusts of hearsay, crumbs of rumor. They are actually really cross if you think about them. What people say about God or your experience or what you've gone through and then you judge God's person to you 
uh, based on what you have gone through or what you're suffering. But I want you to know that God is more than that. God is mindful of you. God loves you. And the biggest lie the devil would lie to you is that God doesn't love you. And one thing he's very likely to do is he would use your experiences to prove to you that God doesn't love you. But you see, you are actually supposed to challenge your experiences with what you know about who your father is. And he says, God has demonstrated, right? He, Romans chapter five and verse six and verse eight, God has demonstrated his love towards you that while you were a sinner, he died for you. That's the best thing that can ever happen to you. Then another person we should talk about is the prodigal son. Think about it. This man, the prodigal son, um, if he did not have the right picture of his father, if he didn't think his father was a loving father, I don't think he will go back. I, 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 I doubt that he will go back. If he felt that his father was unforgiving, his father was judgmental, after wasting, squandering his life, he's not gonna go back. He will just tell himself, you know what, I better just find a way to sort myself out rather than going back to the house. But he knew somewhere in his Noah that God was going to, I mean, his father was going to receive him back. He, he felt it and that's because there was a picture in his heart about who his father is or who his father was. So I want you to know that God, seeing God correctly affects your decisions. He made a decision to go back to his father's house. In those days when, you know, you say you want your own portion of inheritance, you're indirectly declaring that your father is dead. You're saying your father doesn't exist to you anymore, right? And it was somewhat unforgivable, to be honest, if you think about it, that the boy says, give me my inheritance. And then he leaves. He disregards his father. He's saying, I can't wait for you to die. <laughs> you know, since you're not dying, give me the portion of your own, your, the will. So he comes back recites a line in his mind, this is what I'm going to tell my father. And the father doesn't even let him complete his line. He goes on to say, listen, get me the rope, get me a sandal, get me the ring. And he fixes the boy. He makes sure that the boy doesn't get back into the house with shame. He makes sure that the boy doesn't get back with the disgrace that he saw him, he came with. And that's who God is. In fact, the father of the prodigal son, or the father of that rebellious boy, he, he actually did more and beyond the expectation of the boy. He loved him way more. And that's the thing about God. God will beat your expectation of what you think about him. To him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we think or imagine. So if that boy did not have the right picture of his father, he won't go back. But I'm happy that he had a good picture after he repented and he knew that his father was a gracious man and he would receive him. So that is important to know. There was a man Jesus spoke about when he gave a parable about um, the talents, the parable of the talents and some servants. Some he gave five, some he gave two, some he gave one. The ones he gave five, the mul he multiplied his own, he got 10. The one he, uh, the one he gave two multiplied his own and he got four. Then the one he gave one did not do anything about it. But here is what I want to read what that guy said to you. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man. So the guy who received one had a picture of the master that he was a hard man. Another version says he was a harsh man. Reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed and I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth uh, lo there thou hast that is thine this guy was afraid and hid the talent but what produced the fear the fear was produced from a perception of the master he felt that the master was a hard man was a harsh man so that's why I'm saying to you that the fears that you may be experiencing is because you don't know how much God loves you your picture of God has not, the revelation of God's love has not been impressed in your heart so deeply that fear is gone out of your life. You know, the Bible says that perfect love cast out all fears. And this perfection of love is in the perfection of your interpretation of who God is. You must see God correctly. 
you have to know that he's a loving father. He's, he's one who does not upbraid. He, the Bible says he upbraided not. He doesn't say, he doesn't give you the I told you so vibe. That's not God. He doesn't say, uh, he's not a God who cannot give you two chances, three chances, four chances. The righteous will fall seven times, he'll rise again. And that's God. He keeps on forgiving and forgiving. That's God. And in fact, the good news is that he has forgiven. So God has loved you with an everlasting love. So if you are afraid today, you have to deal with that love aspect of your life. Probably you're not, you know, you're not really receiving the love from your father as much as you're supposed to. If you're anxious about life, you need to rest because God loves you. And lastly, I'm going to talk about Jesus and the paralytic man. You know, Jesus in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 2, let me read it for you. It says, and behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick, uh, the palsy, son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And then verse 6. This Before it gets to verse 6, you know, Jesus doesn't say to the, the man who is paralyzed, stand up. That's not what he says. In this particular case, what he says is, your sins are forgiven. And then some of the people around started saying, who is Jesus to say your sins are forgiven? Who is he to forgive sins? Then in verse 6, he now says, that you may know the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then said he to the sick of the palsy, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. So you can see now that the forgiveness of sins translated into his healing. He did not even say be healed. But he says that you may know the Son of Man has power to forgive sins. You're going to see it in the manifestation of his healing. So if you are expecting anything from God, you have to see the right picture, which is the fact that your sins are forgiven. And how did he accomplish this? The gospel. It is understanding the gospel. It is leveraging on what Christ has done for you on the cross that, that enhances your faith enhances your expectation you know that if God has loved you this much there's nothing he cannot do for you and that's what you should understand so your perspective of God is important you know a lot of us think that God is judgmental and that's why you are judgmental to someone else we judge people so much if I think about this how do you feel when people who don't know you assume something about you and you know it's not correct it can be painful many times and many times people just assume uh, who you are based on hearsay or their assumptions and sometimes you may really want people to know you for who you are not for what they think you are and God through the scripture and through uh, Christ wants everybody to know that this is me father I am daddy God I am the one who loves I am the one who cares for you know there's a tendency for us to blame the chaos in the world the problems in the world on God no it, it is not so because God has handed over the affairs. God is so prim and proper that he's given authority to man. He's not going to um, out, outrun or out. He's not going to um, change the order just because he's God. He's just. So he does everything through the agreement and the cooperation of the church. That's why he gave us authority. So it is our, it is our responsibility as believers to establish peace wherever we go. We are the ones, Adam is the one who fell, handed over the systems uh, to, to Satan. And Satan is the prince of the, this world. Okay, the Bible talks about the prince of the power of the air, right? But as a believer, you are seated with Christ far above principalities and powers. And you have authority over this thing. So that even the failings of Adam, you have in your jurisdiction, you have authority to establish the will of God and the peace of God. That's why Jesus said, pray this way, thy kingdom come, okay? And thy will be done here on the earth as it is done in heaven. There is absolute peace in heaven. There is prosperity in heaven. There is shalom in heaven. But here on the earth, Satan is the prince of this world, but we are empowered by the authority of God to establish peace here. And it's important to know that your expectations of God, in summary, your expectations of God your um, your perspective towards life is going to be affected grossly by how you see God. He says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything 
but faith walking through love. So even that, that thing you call faith, that thing you call, you know, I want to get my faith to work, that faith is activated by love. When you know how much God loves you, you will see that great things are happening in your life. The Bible says that if he has given us all things, how much more shall he not with him freely give us all things? I want you to know today that your picture of who God is, is important to your life. You must see God as a loving father. He's your dad. He is your father that cares for you. He is called Abba. And let this be your reflection daily. And I hope this blesses you. And I pray for you in Jesus' name that every fear is gone. Every anxiety is gone. Uncertainties are gone. You see God the way you're supposed to see God. And that will be your experience in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. So please, if you haven't subscribed to our uh, YouTube channel, I want you to subscribe. More episodes are going to come out. And uh, I believe it will be a blessing to you. God bless you.